glad to be here. Um, my name is uh, Isara. I live and work here in Gothenburg. I work at Combitech, technical consultancy company, and I'm part of a department at Combitech called Yoka Q, and we specialize in, in agile development. And I'm a user experience specialist. That means I work with user experience, with usability, business requirement, that sort of thing. Um, and since I'm part of Yudoka Q, who specialize in Agile, I specialize in Agile UX. How do you work with usability when you're doing it Agile? How do you work with um, business requirements when you're going Agile? Because it differs quite a lot from working with, with user experience, working with UX, uh, if you're doing Waterfall. So, what I'm going to talk to you about today is UX in Agile, how to heed the need. Uh, because if there's something that user experience people like myself love to talk about, it's needs. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that, but also about value creation, uh, about UX so far, and about how to integrate UX in Agile in a good way. So, value creation. Um, I started off doing usability work, and then I sort of slided into to Agile. And one of the things that I find is in common between those two areas is the focus on value creation, creating maximum value. Um, but whereas uh, Agile is focused very much on, on value, UX is also focused a lot, about, a lot about the needs, and you believe that you have to satisfy the needs to be able to create value. So the principle is that the ideas that satisfy the needs are the ones that create value. In UX, you believe that you can't create any value uh, without satisfying the needs. Um, so I'm going to tell you a short story just to prove my point, or to try to explain my point. Um, any of you recognize this man? Yeah? Anyone know what this is? No? Um, he has been quite influential in his field, but he's not very well known. His name is Edwin Land. Anyone know who Edwin Land is? No? Um, well, the thing was, um, Edwin Land uh, was very interested in photography, both as a hobby and in his career. and. One day, he was out taking pictures with his three-year-old daughter. And after they had taken some nice summer pictures, his daughter asked him, OK, but now let me see the pictures. And he said, no, honey. <laughs> Can't see them right now. They need to be developed first, you know, cameras and, and all that in film. Um, but she persisted. And uh, if you've met any three-year-olds, I think you know they can be quite persistent. Um, so he thought about it. Uh, and in a couple of hours, he had actually come up with a, with a, a, a rough um, blueprint of an idea of how you could actually do it. This was in 1944. And four years later, the first Polaroid camera reached the market. Uh, product development took a bit longer those days, took four years from the, the, the idea till the finished product. Released in 1948, it was a huge success. Um, I think it, it was released uh, right before Christmas, and it sold out straight away, and made Edwin Land and the Polaroid company lots of money. Uh, they even named the first Polaroid camera after him. It was called the 800 Polaroid Land camera, because he was the CEO of Polaroid, and his name was Land. So it was the Polaroid Land camera. And then they skipped the Land part, because it was such a long name. Um, so it just became the Polaroid camera. But in a sense, by heeding that need, uh, by realizing that the need of his three-year-old uh, could also perhaps be a need for someone else, maybe there are other people out there who are interested in, in seeing the pictures straight away, he was able to, to hugely influence his field of expertise, uh, cameras and Polaroid cameras in particular. This is Life magazine in, I think, 72. 
a genius and his magic camera. And that was all because he could listen to that need and extrapolate on that. So, great idea that satisfy the needs equals value, equals money. Um, well, there are some missed marks out there. I think you all have some examples of uh, products that don't satisfy your needs, that don't create any value to you. Um, I think airport VIP lounges in many, many cases are. Have any of you spent any time in, in, in VIP lounges? Some of you, yeah? How many of you have actually um, paid for that with your own money? No one, no. Exactly. <laughs> the thing is, many airlines have spent lots of money on, on these VIP lounges, believing that they could get not only business travelers, but also leisure travelers to pay for using them. Because they believed that that was in the need of being undisturbed, of uh, you know, being by yourself, uh, not being with the other pesky tourists. They believed that that was an important need with the leisure travelers. Um, but it's not. I mean, as a business traveler, of course, um, you have the need to be able to sit undisturbed, to be able to work. If you're traveling with your family or with your spouse, you don't have that need. And you're not going to want to pay uh, for that uh, using your own money. I mean, as a business traveler, it's another, it's another situation. It's your employer who's paying, and they're paying for you to get your job done. So that's a whole other picture. And this is what happens when you don't know about your customer's needs. You'll end up investing in things, believing that you'll create value when in fact you don't. And that investment, it won't get you any money back, or not the amount of money that you're hoping on. So, I mean, why is it so difficult then? Why, uh, why can't we just go out to people and ask them, okay, what's your need? Tell me about your need. I'll give it to you, you'll pay me money, we'll all be happy. Um, well, that's because we're humans, and we really suck at talking about and expressing our needs, because we're not aware of more than half of them. And Henry Ford, well, he was aware of that, um, as many others have been. Um, if I would have asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. It's a classic, but it still holds, because we're able to talk about our needs. Um, I think the iceberg analogy can be applied to this as well, to human needs, um, as it can to m many other things. At the top, we have the explicit needs. Those are needs that we can talk about, that we can express. If someone asks us about them, we can tell them. But that's only the tip of the iceberg. Then we have, sort of in the middle, those are visible needs. If you're on a boat here, you could sort of look down and, and, and observe some of them. Yeah, but down here, that's where, the, uh, that's where the, the exciting stuff happens. Those are our latent needs. Those are needs that are in our subconscious, that we perhaps dream about, fantasize about, but to get at them, you really need to engage your end, uh, end users. So for example, if I was going on a trip, um, whether I was going to want to use an uh, um, airport VIP lounge or not, if someone were to ask me before the trip, okay, what are your needs? What's important to you when you're going on this trip? I would probably tell them something like, oh, I want to be in that city at that particular time because I don't want to be late for my meeting, for example. Um, I want a window seat. I uh, want some sort of snack during the flight because I get hungry. Um, but if that person would have accompanied me, they would have realized that there were more needs that I wasn't telling them about. So I would have told them about my explicit needs. My missable needs could probably, at least some of them, be observed. For example, if I was having trouble folding my tray down because I have stuffed my laptop in the pouch beneath, you know, that they tell you not to do, but you do it anyway. Uh, <laughs> or if I was having, you know, sort of a c confused situation with a lot of garbage from the snack, and I didn't know where to put it, so I would put it in the pouch as well, such a bad idea. Um, or I was just, if I was just sitting, like squirming, uh, looking uncomfortable, the, the person would realize that, yeah, here are some other needs she hasn't told us about. Those are probably visible needs that we can observe. Um, 
latent needs, that's where innovation happens. Uh, that's what Edwin Land was targeting. That's what Henry Ford was targeting. Uh, trying to satisfy needs that we aren't aware of. Um, that are somewhere down there. And that's, that's really exciting. There you, I mean, you can you use workshops, but it's to try to get things to people to think outside the box, basically. And we're pretty bad at that. I mean, three-year-olds, they're great at that because they don't have enough knowledge of the world around them to limit them. They don't know how stuff works, so stuff can work however. Um, but it's much more important with adults because we are restricted by what we know of the world around us. Um, one example of how you can try to target uh, the, the visible needs and the latent needs, it's just getting out there, getting out there in the reality. Uh, in lean manufacturing, uh, there's this principle called, called Gemba, where Gemba means the real place, the place where value is created. Uh, so, example, in Toyota, when you're looking at the production process, uh, management has to go down to the factory floor to actually look at what's going on. They can't just sit idly by uh, in their offices, uh, relying on second-hand information. They have to go down there. They go on Gemba walks in the factory, where they go around uh, to get a sense of the value creation, to identify ways to practice continuous improvement. Um, and that principle holds. Um, have an, has anyone seen the uh, TV series Undercover Boss? Some of you, yeah? That's, that's Gemba on TV, Gemba TV. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, it's about management going undercover going into their organization, uh, preferably as low down as possible, minimum wages, jobs, stuff like that, and seeing what really happens. And most of the times, they're really surprised, uh, even shocked, about how uh, things are actually going on in the real world. And another thing is that they get quite creative in trying to think of ways to solve these problems. Problems that they had perhaps heard about but hadn't listened to, but once they've experienced it firsthand, um, they get a whole nother understanding. So that's one way of trying to, to get at those needs, those needs that are visible, those, those needs that are latent, not just listening to what people say, but actually looking at uh, what they are doing. All right, I'm gonna go through a brief history just to let you know where you exist today and where we're coming from. Um, I will go back as far as the 1940s. Any guess on why I'm in the 1940s right now? Because of this. Because of the Second World War. And in particular, Air Force in the Second World War. These are spot fires, uh, spitfires, sorry, spitfires. Spot fires. <laughs> I did a presentation that where I talked about Spotify. Um, yeah, spit fires they're called. <laughs> I think my husband is ashamed of me now. I, he's a Second World War fanatic. Mm. Yeah, but <laughs> one of the one of the most popular and, and well known air forces, British air forces. And the thing was, in the First World War, aircrafts were used, but uh, they didn't make such a great impact. They didn't tip the scale. They weren't um, the means of warfare that decided who won or who lost. Uh, but in the Second World War, the technology in the aircrafts had, had come so far that it was a force to be reckoned with in a whole nother way. Um, and the thing was also that um, the technology had became that advanced that you couldn't expect people to adapt to it. Uh, in, in, the, in the early parts of the 1900s, um, you uh, could make the humans adapt to the technology because the technology wasn't that advanced. But when the technology got too advanced, um, you started getting trouble. You started getting trouble getting maximum output from, from, the, from the aircrafts. That is a picture of how it looks in a cockpit in a Spitfire. Uh, that's pretty complex. And flying an aircraft in war is pretty stressful. 
and our cognitive ability is quite limited when it comes to keeping a lot of tasks in our minds at the same time. And we don't so work, work so well under stress. So in the 1940s, you realize that, okay, we have to do something. We have to actually adapt the technology to the human beings instead of expecting people to, to adapt to the technology. So in 1940s was when we started talking about human factors and ergonomics. And I mean, that has to do with understanding the interactions between the technology and, and the human beings. Um, not only to get maximum output to, to improve performance, but also um, for, for well-being reasons. So this was 1940s. In 1980s, you started talking about usability uh, as a sort of measurement. Something has a high level of usability, and you develop different usability heuristics. And usability heuristics, that's a set of guidelines, you could call them, um, things to look about, things to focus on when it comes to looking at a product, making sure it's, if it's usable or not. So this was 1980s. Uh, the ISO standard says that if something has a high level of usability, then it's effective, it's efficient, and the person using it feels happy about it. In the 1990s, the scope was broadened in a sense and you started talking about user experience, UX for short. And you realized that, okay, even though a product is super usable, it's super user friendly and it's super easy and um, yeah, super simple, super quick. Um, maybe people don't love it anyway. How come? Well, it has to do with the, the user experience is subjective, it's dynamic. Uh, and it has to do with other stuff than just usability. It has to, stuff, it has to do with uh, the product being desirable, perhaps, accessible, that it feels high-end, perhaps. And the user experience not only has to do with me using the product, it has to do with me buying the product, uh, getting help with the product when, when it breaks, and ultimately disposing of the product. So that's a much wider range where you look at um, the whole life cycle of the product and also other stuff and usability. Where we are right now, uh, there's been some change in the, in the UX field last couple of years. Agile has uh, been, become very popular and that has affected UX a lot. So right now we can say that there are three main UX approaches right now where the traditional UX is more about, are we actually making a great user experience? Are we creating products that people love, that are easy to use, that are fun, that are um, creating satisfaction? Um, Agile UX is more about how we actually do it. How do we go about? How do we collaborate with others in creating this great user experience? And Lean UX, which is the latest kid on the block, has to do more with actually measuring validating, making sure we're on the right track. Um, Agile UX came along as a way of making designers start working with developers um, in Scrum, for example. How do we do that? How do we collaborate? Um, how do we make sure <coughs> that we as UX professionals uh, can actually collaborate with others and help them along. Um, if you're doing waterfall, then as a, as a UX person, you have quite a long period of time to create something, a pixel perfect prototype, for example, that looks really good and feels really finished. If you're doing Scrum, you don't have time for that. You have to focus on lightweight methods. And of course, you use user stories, um, for example, John, the groom, is getting married. Uh, he wants the cakes to serve at his wedding to be tasty so that the guests will be happy. That would have been a classic user story. I'm, I'm sure you all work with user stories in, in some way or another. Uh, in 2011, a book called came uh, The Lean Startup, it was called, by Eric Ries. And have any of you read it? 
of you. Yeah? Um, the Lean Startup is taking influences from, from Lean uh, and talking about how you can make use of that information to create a, a successful startup. And those principles can be applied to other fields as well, not only if you're doing startup. But of course, in a startup, it's very important to know um, when are you going to persevere, when are you going to continue on with your idea, and wherever it, it takes you, and when do you realize, oh, I'm going in the wrong direction. I need to pivot. I need to go back to where I started from. And this relates back to what Goiko said about road mapping, about trying out different routes and deciding when should I veer off and when should I continue on the route that I've, I'm planned on taking. Um, this book talks about a, a feedback loop, build, measure, learn. Goeco also talked about that. And of course, Eric Ries isn't, isn't the first guy to, to think about this. Uh, it has been done in, in, in other ways as well. Um, but the whole thing is, is you build something, you measure it, and you learn from it. And in that way, you navigate through uh, your roadmap, making sure that what you're doing is, is actually satisfying the needs, is actually creating value. Um, and that book had quite an impact on uh, the UX community. Uh, about 2012, I would say, we started talking about Lean UX. And Lean UX has more to do with actually validating as soon as possible and as often as possible to make sure we're on the right track. Uh, it has to do with you know, build, measure, learn, continuously, iteratively. Um, and in Lean UX, you, you treat user stories not as requirements, but as hypotheses. If we have a user story that talks about John wanting a tasty cake so that his guests will be happy, we need to prove that. That's a hypothesis, and we need to prove it. And maybe we don't need to prove that John wants his, um, his wedding guests to be happy, but maybe we do need to prove that his guests will be happy by a tasty cake. Maybe that's what we want to prove. So in this case, we could say that we intend to prove this hypothesis by showing that seven out of 10 wed wedding guests will be happy if they're served a tasty cake. Uh, in 2013, a book called Lean UX came out. Uh, uh, it talks a lot about user stories as hypothesis, and it also talks a lot about finding your minimum viable product. Um, some of you might have seen the cupcake approach. Uh, in this case, if we're talking about John, and he wants his guests to be happy uh, by serving them a, a tasty cake, I mean, you wouldn't want to go along building an entire big wedding cake to test that hypothesis, and you wouldn't want to just serve him them dry, dry cake, because that wouldn't give any indication of how the actual cake would test. But I mean, a cupcake, yeah, that's a good minimum, vi minimum viable product for testing if a great tasting cake will make people happy. So we go ahead and test that. And maybe we find out that that's not enough. Maybe when it comes to a wedding cake, appearance actually does matter. If we serve cakes looking like this, even if they're tasting good, maybe they won't be happy. So in that case, maybe we have to pivot. We, act, well, we thought that bringing them a tasty cake would make them happy. And they said, what's this? It doesn't look like a wedding cake. Oh, but can't you feel the taste? It's really good. Uh, I don't care. I, I think it should be higher. Yeah. Maybe then we need to pivot and go back. And actually looking at, OK, we realize that we need to look at the appearance of this cake as well. Right. So the last part, UX in Agile. How do you actually make it work? How do you get that uh, focus on the needs? And how do you test things continuously? Um, if we look at the three approaches, traditional UX, what are we actually making? Lean UX, uh, are we making the right thing? And Agile UX, how are we actually working? Do we need to choose? And I say no. Go crazy. Um, do what you like. Nearly, no. But 
you can combine these two. I'm going to show you a clip later of a team that has combined lean UX with agile UX in quite, a, quite an exciting way. And of course, in some, in some ways, even if you're doing Scrum, maybe there's a need for a long pre-study. Sometimes there is. And that's where traditional UX come in comes into play. Um, but you can combine them, of course. It all depends on context and what you're developing and, and um, what kind of product it is. And most UX people are quite used to working iteratively. Uh, there's an ISO standard uh, about human-centered design for interactive system. And this specifies that you should actually work iteratively. Maybe not as fast as in two or four week sprints, but generally most UX people are, are used to working iteratively. Um, pairing, I think that's one of the great things of, of working agile and doing Scrum, is that pairing is, is, um, is so common actually working together, working quite close. That's, that's great. And of course, you can, you can pair different roles as well. And I really like the idea of pairing the product owner with a UX person. I've been doing that uh, in a number of occasions, and I think that's worked very well, because the product owner is a really tough role. I mean, it's, it's quite a lot of stuff that that person has on, on her or his shoulders. They have responsibility for the end users. They have responsibility for um, internal politics, for return of investments, for communicating with everyone. Uh, and it's quite a lot. And usually, most pure product owners aren't really that used to um, working with needs. But UX people are. And UX people are generally quite underrepresented, both on a strategic level as well as hands-on, you know, coding and doing stuff like that. Uh, there is this thing called product stewardship where the product owner and the UX person pairs and works quite closely and divides the responsibility. Whereas the product owner takes responsibility for the business stakeholders, the UX person takes responsibility for the users and the customers and they share the responsibility for the development team, uh, letting them know uh, what they are doing, why they're doing it, uh, but letting, letting the Scrum team do it uh, how they think is best. Um, I've been a UX person in, in some different Scrum teams, uh, in some different constellations and different setups, and I think that what has worked best is me dividing my time between working strategically with the product owner, creating business impact maps, um, doing stuff like that, uh, and then working hands-on in the team, um, sketching, wireframing, pairing, doing stuff like that. That's what I think has worked best. Um, to be able to focus on the needs and the end users throughout a development product project, uh, you need to have some way of exactly, actually ex establishing the, uh, the vision. This also relates back to what Goika was talking about. Getting that vision, getting that sense of why are we doing this? Who are we doing it for? What are their needs? And I think business impact maps or impact maps, as Goika is doing it, is quite a great way to do that. And the reason for this, um, I've limited myself to only one brain slide. Uh, happy about that because I can go on and on about brains. But I'll show you one, just one, because it's such a good one. Uh, in the top row, you have a person reading words. Um, this is an fMRI scan. So where you see light in, lightings up around there, that indicates brain activity, blood flow. In the middle row, where the person is reading sentences, you'll see that it starts lighting up in some new areas there. That means you're, getting, you're using a larger potential p percentage of the brain. You're using your brain's potential in a better way. Reading stories, you see it starts lighting up in, in all around the place, yeah? And this is because we're hardwired for storytelling. We need stories. Um, we, we, uh, we react to stories, we relate to stories. And 
that's why an impact map or a business impact map is a great way of communicating that vision because it tells a story, it gives you a sense of context to the users. I'm too used to sitting in sprint demos where only the product owner is there to accept or um, reject the result of the, of the team. You need to get the, the users there because remember, right, they're really bad about talking about their needs. They need to see it up front to be sure that they like it, that it's something that they will use and be happy about. And in the final sprint, uh, if you're doing a final sprint or if you're doing something after the sprints, you should do a larger evaluation to make sure. Did we satisfy the needs that we wanted? Did we actually create the value? Because that's what it's all about, satisfying the needs to create the value. Yeah, that was all the slides I have, but I have a cool clip for you as well. Five minutes, oh, that's perfect. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, full screen. Yep, there you go. I'm JB Brown, the Nordstrom Innovation Lab Manager, and this is the lab. We work on one week experiments. Somebody will have an idea and we'll find a way to figure out how to prove if the idea is going to work. And this week, the Innovation Lab is going to be building an iPad app with customer feedback as we go through the week. We wanted to work in the store to make sure that we were getting customer feedback as we worked so that we were never working on anything that wasn't valued by the customer and only doing things that are delivering value. So we'll be building a feature and testing it until we get to the point where we have something that's good enough that we can just leave and leave the iPad app behind and have this new thing that customers can use. This is the world's first flash build. It's a flash mob where a software team shows up and builds an application in a surprise location. This is the Nordstrom Innovation Lab, and we're at the flagship store in downtown Seattle. Right now, the team is just setting up their equipment to get started. We're going to build an iPad app that helps customers pick the best pair of sunglasses for them. We really don't know what the features are yet. We're going to use customer feedback as we go along throughout the day and the rest of the week in order to build the best thing. So the next thing we're going to do is a user story map. So we're going to sit here and together outline all the steps the customer would take and actually even beforehand how they buy sunglasses, like what are the, the different things that they might do and how that process might change if we have this application. And we'll actually dig into what we have to build in order to support that process. So now that we've done a card mapping, we're going to do a paper prototype, and this is something that we commonly do in the innovation lab. It's a great way to show what we'd like to do in a rough prototype that we can easily throw out, change, alter, based on feedback from the customers. I'll continue building individual paper slides, and our user experience specialist, Tell, will bring the prototype to a customer and say, OK, I have this app, and this is a paper version. I'd like you to kind of use it like you would normally use an app. And you can press things, interact with them, and then she'll change out the pages based on how the customer uses it. So it's a similar experience to the iPad, only an analog version. So it's day two and we have our first working prototype of this app and how it works is I take my first pair of sunglasses, put it on, take a picture, all right, and then I want to compare it to this other pair I've got right here. Put these on, take another picture, I can just pull these up like this and see which one I like better. Well, Tell and Kim have been talking to people and doing paper prototypes, we've been coding building an iPad. We take a stab at something, we look at the paper prototypes that Kim put together. We might take one at a time. Usually we come to the board and we grab the most important feature and we start implementing it. The really cool thing with this flash build is that we have actual real customers. Just today we delivered four or five different separate features and I deliver it, swap the iPad with Tell. She'd go and talk to a customer and 10 minutes later I had feedback from real customers about this thing that I delivered and it changed how we did the next thing. And it's been really, really great watching day to day what they've been doing, the team, to get all the feedback from the salespeople, the feedback the salespeople have gathered from the customers. And it's a really interesting process to kind of come in. On Tuesday, we had no idea what this would look like. 
there was an idea that somebody had to say, people take a lot of pictures of themselves with the sunglasses. It'd be cool if we could show them side by side to help them make the process better. And that was the idea, that was it. They came in, they had nothing built, and they've been building this literally on the spot throughout each day. And by now, we actually have an app, a functioning app that they can go through. It's very intuitive to help look at themselves and make the sunglass selection process easier, which is pretty cool to watch. So yesterday, the sunglass buyer for Nordstrom came down to check out our progress, and she happened to put on polarized glasses and then held up the iPad in portrait view and was surprised that she couldn't see anything because it was black. And we figured out that the polarization of the iPad running up and down and the polarization of the glasses running vertical cancel each other out. You don't see anything. But if you turn the iPad to landscape, you see it perfectly fine because the polarization of the two items line up and it's okay. So it was a pretty good find to be in the store and she just happened to put on polarized glasses. And so today, first thing we're gonna do is switch it to a landscape design and then lock in the aspect ratio of the iPad so customers and salespeople just naturally pick it up and use it in landscape and not try and go to portrait. Okay, so I'm gonna show you what we've been working on the last five days. We've added quite a few features over the week. You take a picture, multiple pictures of the customer, and then you can pull them up. You tap the first one, you can see it um, larger, and then tap the second, and do a side-by-side -side comparison of each glass next to each other. We also added a feature where you can rename the picture because we heard from salespeople, if a customer's trying on quite a lot of glasses, it's helpful to be able to know what order they were taken in and also rename if you want with the brand or some distinguishing feature about the glass. Another feature we added was the ability to zoom. You can zoom in and really get a good detailed look at the frames side by side. Also to see one of the pictures larger if you want to just better view of one frame. You can flip the camera view as well. Face it forward so the salesperson can take a picture of it like this or you can flip the camera like so. Take a picture of uh, yourself facing forward. And then at the end of it all, we have a button called New Customer, which just erases all of the images and allows the salesperson to start with a new customer. We're just trying to put the final touches on the app. Tell talk to a lot of users, and they said that when we went into the compare view, it was unclear where the pictures were coming from and which picture was which, so the animation here is trying to solve that problem, make it a little more clear what's going on. One of the challenges with software is when you're done, right? And I think the answer is really it depends on how much time you have. At least the most important things got done. So this was time box to a week, and we did a week's worth of work. And it seems like what we have now is something that makes customers happy and addresses the main problems, and something that we can track. We have metrics on. So I think we're going to call that a day. The application has developed so far. Everything's finished, everything that we've asked for, and even the little roadblocks and glitches that we kind of stumbled across as we use the app during the week has been solved. Um, I think that it's going to be really easy to be able to implement into our sale, and I think that we're going to find a lot of success with application, whether it's via a selling tool for us or if it goes public into a downloadable format. Whatever happens, I think this was generally quite a success. Right, that was it for me. Um, do we have time for questions? Yeah. Yes, I am. So just feel free to, to approach me and uh, if you have any other questions. Yeah. Okay, thank you.